Here's some fascinating facts about Zechariah. The name of God is Lord of Hosts is found some 50 times in this book. Zechariah is the longest book of all the minor prophets. Remember, there's major prophets, minor prophets. Minor prophets are the shorter books, but there's, there's, this is the largest of the minor prophets. Zechariah contains more messianic prophecies than any other book in the Old Testament except to Isaiah. The only book that prophetically speaks of the Messiah in Jesus more than uh, Zechariah is the book of Isaiah. And remember, Isaiah had a, was a major prophet. It had a lot more chapters. Zechariah is quoted or referred to at least 40 times in the New Testament. Interesting. 40 references of Zechariah in the New Testament. Zechariah is quoted from or alluded to by other books in Scripture uh, more than any other Old Testament book. Zechariah makes more references and allusions to the coming Messiah than all of the other minor prophets combined. Interesting. More references to Jesus in Zechariah than all the other minor prophets combined. Zechariah saw at least eight different visions in one single night. We'll talk about those visions tonight. There are at least two dozen men in Scripture who bear the name Zechariah, including the author of this book. Zechariah uses the, word, the phrase, word of the Lord, 14 times. Then Zechariah, the city of Jerusalem, check this out. The city of Jerusalem is mentioned 40 times in this minor prophet. And the book of Zechariah has often been called the apocalypse of the Old Testament. Harold Wilmington, the famous Bible scholar, said this, while most Christians are aware of the great messianic prophecies in Isaiah, few are cognizant of the fact that Zechariah is rich with predictions of Christ as well, of both his first and his second comings. And then a notable note, the book of Zechariah makes some amazing and important prophecies concerning the Messiah. Some of the Old Testament prophecies are only found in Zechariah, and they include Christ's entry into Jerusalem on the first Palm Sunday, right? That's chapter 9, verse 9. The betrayal of Christ for 30 pieces of silver, and the usage of those 30 pieces of betrayal money to purchase a potter's field. That's all mentioned in the book of Zechariah. So you guys ready to study the book of Zechariah? All right, let's get into it. Turn in your Bibles to Zechariah, and we're going to have a lot of references tonight to this book. So get your fingers ready to be skinny, scamming through the book of Zechariah as we uh, do a Bible scan on, these, uh, on this uh, uh, second to last book of the Old Testament. Now, second to last book of the Old Testament, but it's the 38th book of the Old Testament. It's the 11th of the mi Minor Prophets. It's the 11th book of the Minor Prophets. Zechariah was a Levite. Born in captivity in Babylon, but he, along with Joshua the high priest and Haggai the prophet, joins Zerubbabel with 50,000 other Jews to go back to Israel to do what? To rebuild the temple. So he was a part of the, the, the exiles. He was in Babylon, and then, remember, uh, they were given permission to go back to Israel to do two things. One, Nehemiah was given permission to go back to Israel to rebuild the walls. So Rebbebel was given permission to go back to Israel to rebuild the temple. And he was a part of this group of 50,000 Jews to do this. His ministry began two months after Haggai, which we looked at last week. And it's possible he was stirred to service by the message of Haggai. His ministry complemented Haggai's in stirring the people with regard to completing the temple. Now, Haggai addressed the people of Israel, but Zechariah is addressing the leaders of Israel. And so this book of Zechariah and his prophetic uh, utterances in this book are primarily directed towards leadership to get them going, going again. Remember last week we saw they, they came back to Israel with 50,000 people with, with orders from the Lord and from the prophets to rebuild the temple, but they stalled. For 14 years, they stopped what they were supposed to do. And they started building their own houses and their own paneled houses and everything else. And Haggai last week, remember, prophetically strongly urged them, stop building your own houses and get back to building the house of God. Focus on the kingdom and get back to what you're supposed to be doing and building God's temple again. And Zechariah is going to be doing that now with leadership also. Zechariah is comprised of 14 chapters that might be divided into four sections. Section 1, chapter 1, one through 6, is a call to return. And not only a call to return to Israel, but a call to return to God. We'll see that in a minute. Then section 2, chapter 1, verse 7 through chapter 6 through 8, is a series of visions. Multiple visions are listed in this book. Section 3, chapters 6, 9 through chapter 9, is a series of messages. And then section 4, chapters 10 through 14, are portraits and prophecy. So let's look at, first of all, the call to return. Are you, everybody in Zechariah? 
If you're not there, get there. Zechariah chapter 1, verse 3, call to return. Let's read it. It says, therefore say to them, God speaking to Zechariah, say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may what? I like that. God says, return to me so I might return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, after he's telling the people to get back to work, he's also telling them to get back to who? Get back to God. Get back to God. And so the importance in what Zechariah is saying to the people is not only get done what you're supposed to get done and rebuild the temple, but get back to God. You've walked away from God. Remember in Ephesus, the church in Ephesus, great church. It's a flagship church of the Roman Empire. But Jesus said in Revelation, in his messages to the different churches, to Ephesus, he said, you've done good works, you're continuing to do good works, but I have this one thing against you. You left your first love. Return to your first love. Remember the deeds you did at first. Repent. Get back to God. Question. If you're far from God, who moved? You did. The Bible says draw near to God. And what? He'll draw near to you. He's just waiting. Jesus said, I will be with you always. Lo, I'll, I'll always be with you, but I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But we can walk away from closeness to God if we choose to. And what we need to do is we need to return. If we feel far from God, get back to, to getting in the Word. Remember the deeds you did at first when you were close to God. You were in the Word. You're not only in the Word, you were in church. You're not only in church, but you were worshiping Jesus, not just Sunday mornings, but during the week. You had a passion for the Lord. Get back to that. If you're far from that, just return. Repent and return and remember the deeds you did at first. That was a message to Ephesus. That's a message to us. Then also Zechariah 1.4 says this. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return now from your evil ways, from your evil deeds. But they did not listen or give heed to me, declares the Lord. See what it's saying there? Zechariah warns them to, be like, to not be like those who heard the call of God but refused to respond. It's called getting hard-hearted. One of the reasons why we drift from God sometimes, not only busyness, not only only life and the world and kind of getting pulled away with all the stuff we're doing, but sometimes we get get distant from God a little bit because we're not responding to his voice. He's telling us to be obedient in this area, and we don't. And he's telling us, okay, do this, and we don't do this. And what that causes is a callousness on our heart when you get a callous heart, a hard heart, you start drifting away from God. And one of the things that I remember David said in Psalm 51, we read it last Sunday, create in me what? A clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. What's a right spirit? The spirit of obedience. A spirit that says, if God tells me to do that, if he tells me to jump, I'm going to say, how high? God's telling me to do this. I'm gonna, even if it doesn't make sense to me, I'm going to do it because God's, God's God and I'm not. And, and the heart of obedience is the right spirit. And a clean heart is the right spirit too. We've got to guard our hearts. This is a filthy world we're living in. It wants to pollute our hearts. It wants to dirty our hearts. It wants us to get pulled into the sludge of this world. We've got to guard our hearts. Out of, we've got to guard our hearts with diligence, the Bible says, because out of our hearts flow the issues of life. We got to be careful with this. Is one, stay close to God, stay intimate with God in our relationship with him, but two, guard our hearts and repent and return and keep a soft heart towards God's voice and that'll keep us close to God. So that's, that's the first section is called to return. Section two is a series of visions and he has several visions in section two which is chapters one, seven through six, eight. I'll give you just some of the titles of some of the visions. Visions number one is uh, one, chapter 1, verses 7 to 17, and that's the four horsemen. They're not the four horsemen listed in Revelation 6. They're just four horsemen that are surveying the earth. And they come back with a good report because the people had, had started turning to the Lord. We see that in chapter 1, 7 to 17. Vision 2, the four horns and four crops. Craftsmen. Now, whenever you see horns in the scripture, the horns are talking about authority and power. 
horns are always authority and power. And so in Zechariah 1, 18 to 21, the horns are the nations that scattered Israel. Perhaps a reference to the nations from Nebuchadnezzar's image in the book of Daniel. Remember, there was four parts of that image in the statue. The first part was the, the uh, symbolic of Babylon. The next part was symbolic of uh, Medo-Persians, which took over after Babylon. The third part of the statue was Greece. And the fourth part of the statue was what? Roman Empire. And so these four horns listed in Zechariah are, are pointing to the four empires, world empires. And then chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, is a measuring line. And the measuring line speaks to the promise that Jerusalem will be rebuilt. It's getting, it's getting the carpenter's measuring, measuring line out. And as the carpenter's measuring the line, it's a promise through the prophetic word here that Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. It's in ruins right now, but it's going to be rebuilt along with the temple. And that's the hope that Zechariah is giving in the, in the vision of the measuring line. And then Zechariah 3, 1 through 10. I, this is such a cool vision. I want us to read Zechariah 3, 1 through 10. At least 1 through 8. Turn to Zechariah 3, 1 through 8. And then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. Rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, standing before the angel. And he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. And again he said to me, See, I have taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. And then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And while the angel of the Lord was standing by, and the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, and thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways, if you will perform my service, then you will also govern my house and will have charge over my courts and I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. This is a cool vision because this is still happening today. Satan, according to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, is the accuser of who? Brethren. And he stands before God day and night accusing us before God. He's, and he accuses you personally. That's why the Bible says we need to claim verses like Romans 8, 1 that says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus, right? Because what Satan is trying to do is he's trying to make you feel guilty and unworthy of even having a relationship with God. That's his goal. Because if he, if he condemns you enough and you listen to those lies, it'll drive you away from God also. But one of the neat things with this picture of this vision is God takes away the filthy garments, and he gives them beautiful robes instead. Isn't that a picture of what Christ has done on the cross? 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's what's happened. The Bible says in Romans 5.1, therefore having been justified, justified means declared righteous, declared innocent in a legal court. Therefore, have been justified by what? By faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here's what's happened. The, the moment you put a saving faith in Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's actually there's a, there's a transaction that's happened. What's happened, in, and theologians call it imputed righteousness. What happens is the moment you put a saving faith in Jesus Christ, therefore, have been justified by faith you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the deal. Satan, according to Colossians, or, or actually Jesus, according to Colossians, has disarmed the powers and principalities of hell when he died on the cross. And he canceled our certificate of death when, and, and was nailed to a cross. And well, here's what happened. When Jesus died on that cross, he said, it is finished, what? Literally, what does it mean? Paid in full. So anybody that believes in Jesus Christ after his death on the cross for our sins, it's paid in full. It's paid in full. Anything you've ever done, it's paid in full. And here's what's happened. You put a saving faith in Jesus Christ, he takes your filthy rags of sin and he nails it to the cross. And then he takes his righteousness and he clothes you with his righteousness. And so when God views you now, He's not viewing you in your sin. He's viewing you with your robe of righteousness. 
and he sees you through the lens of the blood of Jesus, and you're clean. Even though your sin is a scarlet, I like this, <laughs> you're white as snow. God has made as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has taken your transgressions away from you. You're forgiven. You're not, you're not clothed, clothed, clothed anymore with filthy rags of sin. You're clothed with the robes of righteousness. And that's why the Bible says that you don't have a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but a spirit of sonship by which you can cry out, Abba, Daddy, Papa. How do you say it? Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a Puerto Rican way of saying Papa. What is it? Huh? Papi. That's Papi. It's Papi. And uh, my nickname with my kids now, they're already starting to get me ready for grandkids, I think. They're, they're calling me Pop Pop. <laughs> I'm Pop Pop. And that's a term of endearment already by my, by my kids. But we call him Abba Father. And Abba Father views us in the robes of righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we don't have condemnation anymore covering us. We got grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. That saved a bunch of wretches like us. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's, that's so cool. I could, I, could, I could spend the next rest of the whole Bible study talking about that, but we'll, get, we'll go on. Because that's a cool vision that he has there about the robes of righteousness. Okay, now going on, Zechariah uh, 4, 1 to 14 is the lampstand. And in this picture, in, in vision number uh, uh, 4 here, or, or vision number uh, 5, is the picture of a lampstand. And the lampstand was lit with oil that came directly from an olive tree. And the message with this lampstand getting fed by olive oil is the message this, Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. What's, what's the message that's going forth to Israel now that's in the process of building, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the city? How's it going to get done? Is it going to be done by their might or their power? No, it's going to be done by what? By God's spirit. It's still true today. You want to do anything eternal for God. You want to make any difference spiritually or eternally in this world. It ain't going to be done by your might nor by your power. It's only going to be done by the Spirit of God. And that's why we need to be Spirit-dependent Christians. We need to walk in the Spirit, not in the flesh. We need to be going governed by God's Spirit, filled with God's Spirit, and then we're going to build things for God and do things for God. And that's including expanding His kingdom. You can't do it in the flesh, but you can do it by the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, that's what the Bible says. Allow the Spirit to guide you, to lead you, to fill you, to use you, and He will. The Spirit is called the helper. The Spirit is called the counselor. The Spirit is called the teacher. The Spirit is called the comforter. The Spirit is called the, the, one, the parakletos, the one who wants to stand alongside us and help us. And it's not by our might, nor it's by our power. It's got to be by the Spirit. We need to be more Holy Spirit Christians. We do. I think sometimes we forget about the third person of the Trinity. We, even Calvary Chapel. We're so, so we're so into the Word, and we should be. The Word of God is a part of being Spirit-filled Christians, right? But we're so into the Word sometimes, we for, forget about the other wing on the airplane, which is the Holy Spirit. The Ho Holy Spirit and the Word of God are our two wings that help us fly spiritually, Right? And as we're allowing the Holy Spirit to, to be in us and working through us, we're going to be building things for the kingdom, just as they're exhorted to build Jerusalem again through the Spirit, helping them to do that. Vision number six. This is an interesting one. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 5, 1 to 4 is a flying scroll. And Zechariah sees this enormous flying scroll. Can you say UFO? No, I'm just kidding. But it's a picture of this flying scroll. And the sizes for emphasis, the scroll has five words written on both sides. The scroll reads, side one, every thief shall be expelled. Side two, every perjurer shall be expelled. These are violations of the moral law. Interesting. Those are the two moral laws that we looked at the last two Sundays in the Ten Commandments series. Thou shalt not what? Thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not bear false witness. 
And they're being reminded of this by this flying scroll. Interesting. Um, also, uh, vision number seven, Zechariah 5, 5 through 11, is a giant basket. And this kind of basket normally carried grain. However, this one carried a woman and it had a lid. And the woman is a picture of wickedness, and the basket being carried away may illustrate how the Babylonian captivity cured Israel of idolatry. So again, another object lesson there, this giant, giant basket. The last vision, vision number eight, Zechariah 6, 1 through 8, is four chariots. And the four chariots come from between two mountains of bronze. And this would indicate judgment. These chariots are different than the four horses, again, in Revelation. The chariot horses were spiritual beings. There's a spiritual arena that we're not often aware of. Listen, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. He's talking about his servant. And then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Elisha saw, or he had a servant see, all these hosts of heaven, all these angels that were helping them. And they were in chariots. Interesting. I thought, I'd love some time on a Wednesday night if the Lord just did that for us as servants of the Lord. If we could just see all the angels that are joining with us in worship. I believe that. I believe there's heavenly angels that are even designated for different churches. We see there's an angel designated for every single church in the, of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. An angel was designated to be the angel for that church. And I think there's angels doing spiritual warfare for us, even as we meet together. I think there's spiritual angels sometimes that are, that, are, are, that are fighting against demonic forces that are trying to stop things in services. You know, every time we meet as a church, there's spiritual warfare going on. Hey, if you have any doubt about that, just talk to our guys in the sound booth back there. It's amazing all the stuff that can go wrong. We've, we've had services where all the light, everything just turned off electrically. I'm going, oh, Lord, please let this be a short one. I was worried about that this, this last Sunday. With everybody's power, people losing power. It's like, okay, just like Satan, he would, he'll, he's going to get the power turned off on the church campus, and we'll be sitting here on Sunday morning, and we'll all be sitting in the dark. And, and we'll, but praise the Lord, we'd still be here, though, right? Amen? <laughs> Amen. And that's, that, there's, there's spiritual Demo demonic things going on when a church service is happening because Satan hates when Christians gather in Jesus' name and worship his enemy, Jesus Christ. Not only does he hate it, he hates the Word of God. And he hates when you guys are getting fed the Word of God and when the Word of God together because the Word of God is what equips us for righteousness. And so when you, we gather together, we are going against the enemy, and we're doing the opposite of what he wants us to do, and that's stay away from church, stay away from the Word, stay away from gathering it together as Christians. But what does the Bible say about our gathering? Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Amen? Should we be meeting less as we're getting close to the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ? No. All the more, the Bible says, as we see the day drawing near. Amen? And you know what? I, I don't get it. I, I, I don't get it when people say they're serious Christians, but they don't want to go to church. I bleed church. When we go on vacations as a family, I'm going to find a church to go to on Sunday morning with my family. Because I want to be in church, even on vacation. I want to get in the presence of God and worship God and hear from God's Word. I really like it on vacation because I could just sit back and be ministered to. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. But we should prioritize being together in these last days. Amen? Amen. It's very important. It's very important. It keeps us strong. It keeps us sharp. As iron sharpens iron, we sharpen one another. Okay, now, it goes from these visions now to messages. And I'll give you some of the messages, just a, a scanning of some of the messages in Zechariah. Message number one, Zechariah 6, 9 through 15, God speaks and he tells Zechariah to take silver and gold and to make a crown and place it on the high priest. Look at uh, chapter 6, verses 12 to 13. If you're at chapter 6, 12 to 13, say amen. amen. Look what it says. Then, then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, behold a man whose name is Branch, for he will... Uh, 
He will branch out from where he is and will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Thus he will be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace will be between the two offices. That's a messianic prophecy. And it's talking about a priest who's also a king. And who is that? Jesus. We have a high priest who's passed through the heavens according to the book of, of Hebrews. And that high priest is, uh, understands our weaknesses because he's been tempted in all things such as we are, yet without sin. Now in the Old Testament, there was a different, differentiation between priest and king. They didn't mix those two usually. But with Jesus, this points to Jesus, he is a king. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but he's also a priest because he connects us. He's the bridge back to God. And that's what priests did is they represented people before God and brought them to God. So that message one is pointing to Jesus as the priest king. Message two, it's chapter seven, one through seven, it's uh, God speaks again, and a group of men come to the temple to pray to the Lord with questions about fasting. Look at chapter seven, verse three. 7 verse 3, it says, Speaking the priests who belong to the house of the Lord of hosts and the prophets, saying, Shall I weep in the fifth month and abstain as I have done these many years? Now, the, these priests are talking about fasting. And this whole section of the second message is talking about fasting. Chapter 7, 1 through 7 is, is talking about fasting. And the men prayed, who prayed asked, Should we fast? Look at God's reply, chapter 7 verse 4. Should we fast is the question. Then the word of the Lord came to the host, uh, came to me saying, Say all the people of the land and to the priests, when you have fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months, these 70 years, was it actually for me that you fasted? And when you ate and drank, did you eat for yourselves or do you not drink for yourselves? Are these not the words which the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous with its cities around it and the Negev and the foothills were inhabited? So this is talking about fasting. Interesting. Question. Fasting. Should we still be doing it today? Yeah. Yeah. What is fasting? It's, it's, it's giving up something, denying your flesh to seek God. Typically, it's done with food. Typically, what fasting is for is, is it's a denial of your flesh of food for a short period of time, so that you could, you could, instead of be eating during those periods of time, you could be praying. There's power in that, by the way. There's power of connecting with God during fasting, in times of fasting and prayer. So let me give you some tips on fasting. And we'll look at just a few scriptures on fasting, because I th well, one of the things we're going to be doing, I'm looking forward to, I think it might be next week in our small groups, our James McDonald is going to be talking about the spiritual discipline of fasting. I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say about that. But a um, couple tips on fasting. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18, and we'll see how we're supposed to fast if God calls you to give up something and seek God through prayer during that time of denial of the flesh. Here's, how, here's the spirit we're supposed to do it in. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. If you're there, say amen. All right, 16. And whenever you fast... Do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance in order to be seen fasting by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you may not be seen fasting by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will repay you. So, when you fast, should you be proclaiming it to everybody? Should you be walking around, oh, I am so hungry. <laughs> I'll never forget that one of the first times I ever fasted uh, was right before I asked Heidi to marry me. And I needed a word from God. I was nervous about this marriage thing. And so I went away. I was single. I was in Southern California. I took three days off from work and I just, for three days, I'd never fasted before. For three days I didn't eat anything and all I did was drink water. And I prayed. And after three days, it was one of the clearest voices from heaven I've ever heard from the Lord. The Lord told me clearly that Heidi was the one and I was supposed to be married to Heidi. Ask her, knucklehead. He didn't say that, but that's the gist. He made it very clear, don't let her get away. And shortly after that, I asked her to marry me. And within a 
a few months we were married. But it was so refreshing because I was scared of marriage. I grew up in a home where there was a lot of marital problems, a lot of infidelity, a lot of, oh, man, battles. And I was, oh, I, was, I wanted to marry the right person. And that's a part of what fasting and prayer is for. It, gets you, it, it denies your flesh, but it gets you in tune with God. And a lot of times, if you're trying to seek God for a direction in life, spend a day or two just giving up the food. In that time, you would be eating. Pray and seek the Lord. See what he does during that time. It's wonderful. A couple other tips on fasting. Um, look at, uh, let's look at Isaiah 58, 5 through 7. Turn, turn back to Isaiah 58, 5 through 7. says, is it a fast like this, which I choose a day for a man to humble himself? It is for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed. Will you call this a fast, even acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast which I chose to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke? It is to div- it is. Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into the house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? There's another purpose of fasting, to break chains. You know, one time Jesus was out, up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John, and he was up there uh, transfigured. Remember, they saw Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And as soon as they came down from the mountain, they... they the other disciples were trying to deliver this de- demon-possessed boy from demons. And they couldn't do it. The boy was like throwing himself on the ground and you know, doing crazy things and everything else. And they were praying up a storm and nothing was happening. And then Jesus came down. Bam. Delivered the boy, set him free. Shackles were broken. Demons were gone. The disciples were like, wow. How'd you do that? And Jesus said, this kind can only come out through what? Prayer and fasting. And that's what Isaiah is talking about here. It's a fast. It's a a time to humble ourselves. It's a time to, verse 6, to loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the bands of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. So if you feel like you're in bondage, something that's got a grip on you, man, maybe take, take a day or two fast. Seek the Lord. Pray for God to set you free, man. Break those chains. And he will. He will. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, (laughs) you'll be free indeed. I love that. There's power in prayer. There's power really in prayer and fasting too. It gets you in tune and breaks the shackles. It's part of what we're doing through prayer and fasting. Hmm. All right, let's go on. I'd go on with that for a while too, but let's, let's keep going here. Message three uh, is, the, is chapter seven, verses eight through 14, the reason for their captivity. Here's the reason in chapter seven, verses eight to 14, why they were in captivity. They refused to hear. God was speaking, but they didn't want to hear what God was saying. They stopped up their ears. Hey, does that happen to us? Can't hear you, God. I don't want to hear you, God. And next thing you know, you're in captivity because you didn't listen. And you got things gripping you again because you're not listening to what God's telling you to do. You know what? Satan puts this stuff in front of us to, to tempt us, right? And he tempts us with it, saying it's going to be a, so much fun to do it. And, and the temptation leads to bondage and to captivity. That's the thing about sin. Sin might be pleasurable for a season, but sin bite, turns around and bites you because it gets you in captivity. It gets you in bondage. Where truth sets you free, sin puts you in prison. And that's, that's what he's talking about here in Zechariah chapter 7, 8 to 14. Now, message 4 is the promise, uh, Zechariah 8, 1 through 19, the promise that Jerusalem will be restored. Verse 8, uh, or chapter 8, verses 2 and 3 tells us that God is zealous and will return and restore and reign. Interesting. Uh, chapter 8, 4 through 5 speaks of peace. And then God speaks to these workers here. Listen to what he says. Chapter uh, 8, uh, verses 18 to 22. Let's read that together. Uh, go back to Zechariah, chapter 8, 18, uh, 18 to 22. It says, Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, The fast of the fourth, the fast of the fifth, 
The fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth months will become joy, gladness, and cheerful feast for the house of Judah. So love, truth, and peace. And thus says the Lord of hosts, it will be yet that the people, will, many will come, even the inhabitants of many cities, the inhabitants of one will go to another. Let us go at once and entreat the favor of the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts, and I will also go, is what he's saying there. That's good stuff. It's a return of Israel to, to, to their homeland and to their nation. And interesting because that's happening right now in our generation. Israel's returning. Just as they returned from Babylon back with Zerubbabel and then with Nehemiah uh, back to their homeland. So there's prediction all throughout the Old Testament that at the end of the world, end of the age, Israel and the people of Israel are going to come back to Israel. And it's happening before our very eyes. In 1948, they became a nation again after 1,900 years of not having their homeland and not being a nation. Interesting, uh, 1967, the Six-Day War, they regained Jerusalem. Against all odds, nations that, you know, had control of that city, no way they should have won that war. They did, because God said they would. God said they'd return and have their land again. And it's happening before our very eyes, which is one of the greatest indications that we're getting close to the end of the world, because Israel's returning. Just as after Babylon, now after these 1,900 years, is returning to their land. Now, message number five is uh, Zechariah 9, <clears throat> and that's judgments against nations. Zechariah 9, uh, verses 3 to 4, is the prophetic pronouncement on Tyre, uh, the judgment of Tyre. And then chapter 9, verse 9, tells, interesting, turn to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. This is a very prophetic scripture. I actually got it circled in my Bible. Look what it says. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just, endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What's that pointing to? When? That's the very first Palm Sunday, isn't it? It's when he comes into uh, Jerusalem on his donkey, and people are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the scripture is pointing right to that event, even though it's hundreds of years before Jesus is going to do that. I love the prophetic scripture. It all points to future events, and it nails it, and nails those future events to those prophetic things. Okay, that's, that's uh, Zechariah, uh, the triumphant entry. Now, Zechariah 9.11, look at Zechariah 9.11. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I have set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Do you know God, Old Testament and New Testament? Blood is a part of his covenant. It's part of the Old Covenant. It's part of the New Covenant. And the blood of the lamb in the Old Testament was what their Passover was. Passover, is the, it was the uh, uh, forgiveness of their sins through the blood of the lamb. And how are we forgiven? Is it through our works? Is it through going to Calvary Chapel? No, how are we forgiven? By the blood of the lamb. By the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let me tell you some things that the blood of the lamb has done for us. We were dead in sin. Blood, blood of the Lamb now has made us alive in Christ. Blood of the Lamb. Before the blood of the Lamb, we followed the world. We were conformed to the world. Now we follow Christ because of the blood of the Lamb. Before the blood of the Lamb, we were controlled by the flesh. Now, because of the blood of the Lamb, we're led by the Spirit. Before the blood of the Lamb, we were under wrath. Check this out. Now we're under grace. Love that. Before the blood of the Lamb, we were without Christ. Now, because of the blood of the Lamb, we're in Christ. Before the blood of the Lamb, we were strangers of the promises. Now we're called not only servants, but sons and daughters. And Jesus even called us friends because of the blood of the Lamb. Isn't that amazing? God in the flesh said, I'm not even going to call you servants anymore. I'm going to call you my friends. And we're joint heirs with Jesus Christ because of the blood of the Lamb. We're part of his family. Wow. Before the blood of the Lamb, we were without hope. Now, with the blood of the Lamb, Christ in us. It's the hope of glory. Isn't that awesome? The blood of the Lamb. Before the blood of the Lamb, we were victims of the devil. He was killing us. He was stealing us. He was destroying us. We're not victors, victims anymore. Guess what? We're victors. Thanks be to God 
who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that cool? We're not losers anymore. We're winners because of the blood of the Lamb. And I praise God for that. I like being on the winning side. Always have, always will. I always, I always like, like being on winning teams. I don't know. It's a competitive nature of mine. But I'm on the greatest winning team right now. And that's Jesus' team. And if you doubt that it's a winning team, read the book of Revelation. In the end, we win. That's awesome. We win. We're on the winning, winning side. Now chapters 10 through 14, are, we go from the, the visions and the messages to the portraits and po- prophecy. Um, so we're just going to highlight this. We're just, I just want to point to a few portraits of po- prophecy that are important here. First one, look at chapter 10, verse 4, prophetically. From then will, for the, chapter 10, verse 4, if you're there, say amen. From them will come the what? The cornerstone from the tent peg, from the bow of battle, from every ruler, all of them together. Now, who's the cornerstone? It's Jesus. Jesus. Plenty of scripture points to Jesus being the cornerstone. 1 Peter 2, verses 6 through 8. Great scripture. 1 Peter 2, 6 through 8. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be what? disappointed. This is precious value then, and it's for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders uh, rejected, this became the very cornerstone, a a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, for they stumble because they're disobedient to the word, and to this doom they are also appointed. So cornerstone, all throughout the scripture, Jesus is the cornerstone. Psalm 118 verse 22 says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Now, what is a cornerstone? Well, the, the very name points to what a cornerstone is. It's put in the corner. And the way they built houses in that day, they built them out of stones. And what the cornerstone would be, two things. First of all, the cornerstone would be put in the, the very first stone put in, in the corner. And then it would be not only a foundation stone for that house that's being built, but a direction center. It would set the whole direction for the rest of the building of the house. See the analogy for Jesus? He's our foundation. Him and his word are our foundation. It's a rock foundation, according to Matthew chapter 7. He is the foundation. His word is the foundation. It's a rock foundation. But not only is he a foundation for us, he's what we build our lives on, but also he sets the direction for our lives. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, what? Acknowledge him. And he'll do what? He'll direct your paths. He'll set the direction for your life. And it'll be a blessed direction. You want to have a messed up life, just do it yourself. We are very good at self-destructing ourselves. Do you know that? Our tendency is to really mess things up in our flesh. But you allow Jesus to start being the foundation and the direction center. And start, life starts getting blessed. Because you're going God's way instead of your way. That's why it says in Romans 12, 2, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the will of God. Listen to what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. That's God's will. And as you allow Jesus to be the foundation and the direction center for your life, life is good. Life is acceptable. Life is even perfect. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, does that mean life is easy? No. Come on. We're in a war here. There's a real devil and there's real demons. There's a battle. We're in a cursed world. There's sickness and there's issues and there's sweat of the brow. We're eking out a living because of this whole Garden of Eden thing. It's tough. It's not easy. But it's a lot better with Jesus as he's the foundation, the cornerstone, and he's the direction center. And life could be blessed instead of cursed. That's why the Bible says, choose life, not death. Choose blessing, not cursing. Choose life. Choose God. Let him direct and be the foundation for your life. And and God will bless, and it will be rock, too. It will be a rock foundation. So that's one of the prophetic scriptures. Here's another one of Zechariah chapter 11. Look at 12 and 13. Chapter 11, 12 and 13. It says, And I said to them, 
If it is good in your sight, give me my wages, but if not, never mind. So they weighed out 30 shekels of silver as my wages. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that magnificent price at which I was valued by them. So I took the 30 shekels of silver and threw them to the potter in the house of the Lord. What is that pointing to? Judas Iscariot, for 30 pieces of silver, is going to betray Jesus Christ and lead him to his death. And then he takes the money after he realizes what he's done, and he throws it in a potter's field. This is hundreds of years after this was, this was prophetically written by Zach, Zechariah, pointing to the betrayal of Jesus Christ in, uh, by Judas Iscariot. Interesting. Um, another portrait of prophetically uh, is Zechariah chapter 12, and it talks about Jerusalem. You can read it yourself if you want to later, but it's talking about, uh, uh, it speaks of the tension Jerusalem will see, receive in the end times, how, how the whole world will be kind of focused on Jerusalem. Now, that's interesting because Jerusalem is an insignificant city even today. It's a small, it's a small city. It's an insignificant in regards to its wealth, in regards to its commerce, its industry, but it's a powerful city even today. It's amazing how much attention one city that's insignificant, small, not that much business going on, the whole world kind of focuses on Jerusalem and what's happening in Israel. It's amazing. Um, look at Zechariah chapter 12, verse 3. It points to this. It says, And it will come about in that day that I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples, and all who lift it will be severely injured, and all the nations of the earth will be gathered Against it. That's actually prophetically pointing to even Armageddon in Israel, all the nations coming against Jerusalem and Israel in the last days before the battle of Armageddon. Interesting. But it's a heavy stone. What does that mean? It means it's got force, it's got focus. In Jerusalem to this day, it's amazing how much attention is to Israel and to Jerusalem. It's because it's, it's, it's the center in regards to what, 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 uh, what God's going to be doing in these last days, Israel and, and Jerusalem is. Interesting, too, uh, the Muslims claim uh, Jerusalem, this city, is theirs. And Israel has even given some concession to the Muslims because who, who, who has control over the Temple Mount where the Holy Temple of Israel used to be at? Is it Jews? No, it's Muslims. And wh- why is that so important to, to, to Muslims, by the way? Why do they want Jerusalem as their city and the Temple Mount as their property and they run it? Though there's this myth in the Muslim world that uh, Muhammad, the founder of the Muslim world, ascended, ascended to heaven from the Temple Mount. And that's why their Dome of the Rock, their huge mosque with a gold top to it, is sitting on the Temple Mount where the Holy Temple used to be. Because they believe that's where... where uh, where he ascended, Muhammad ascended into heaven. But interesting, there's not one reference in the Quran to Jerusalem. Even though they said, this is our city, we need to own this city. The Quran doesn't even mention Jerusalem one time. Guess how many times the Bible mentions Jerusalem as God's city in the city of David? 798 times Jerusalem was talked about all throughout the scriptures. So whose city is it? It's, it's ultimately when Christ comes back, it's going to be Jesus' city, the son of David. That's where he's going to have his headquarters. That's where he's going to reign. So if you ever get a chance to go to Israel with us, when you're in Jerusalem, one of the wonderful things is we kind of descend and walk down to the city of Jerusalem together as a group, and it's a holy city. Because you could just sense this city is a special city because this is where Christ is going to come back. And he's going to reign as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he's going to re- have the temple rebuilt there. And he's going to teach the peoples and the, and the kingdoms from that place, that headquarters, the city of Jerusalem. Amazing place. It's a heavy stone according to the scripture there. Interesting. Let's, 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 a couple more prophetic uh, scriptures I want to point to and then we're going to close the prayer. Uh, Zechariah chapter 12. We're in ch- chapter 12. Look at verse 10. It says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they'll look on me, me is capitalized, pointing to Jesus, they'll look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they'll weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. Interesting. What's that pointing to when it says they'll look on me whom they have pierced? Yeah. 
the crucified Savior. And that's Israel looking at Jesus when he comes back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And they're going to weep, saying, we put him on a cross. And they'll see his wounds. Because you know what? The Bible says, even in heaven, Jesus is like the lamb who was slain. Those scars he got for being crucified for us, he'll have them for eternity. And the Jews, when he returns, these, these Jewish people that have come to Christ during the Great Tribulation will be mourning and weeping, realizing we gave you those wounds as a nation. Amazing. And part of our worship in heaven, listen to this, people. Part of our worship in heaven is worshiping Jesus and seeing the scars saying, you did that for me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the Lamb who was slain. We worship you, Jesus. And part of our worship is because of what he's done for us. Amen? Amen. One of the reasons why I love Jesus so much is because he loved me first by dying on a cross for my sins. We love because he first loved us, the Scripture says. And that's one reason why we celebrate communion. And if you're any kind of Christian, when you celebrate communion, you should be moved. You think about the blood and the body of Christ for you. It should move us to love him more. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay, so that's another prophetic scripture pointing to the cross and the wounds. Um, hmm. Another prophetic scripture is verse 4, chapter 13, talking about false prophets. It says this, Also it will come about in that day that the prophets will each be ashamed of his vision. When he prophesies, they'll be put on the hairy robe in order to deceive. Now, one of the things that's going to happen at the end of the age, Matthew 24, just read it in my quiet times, uh, uh, Matthew 24 points to the fact when we get close to the end of the age, false prophets are going to rise like never before. False Christs even, people saying they're the Christ are going to rise like never before to deceive people. And that's happening before our very eyes. Just turn on your television set. There's a lot of false teaching going on. And what, how do we guard against the false prophets that are rising up in these last days? Right here. The Bible says the Bereans were noble-minded because they searched the Scriptures themselves to see what they were being taught, whether it was true or not. Be careful if someone who's teaching you is telling you, don't be a student of the Word. You, sh you should... Any true teacher of God's Word is going to encourage you to study the Word yourself. And I want you to be doing that here at Calvary Chapel. I want you to be Bereans. I want you to be noble-minded. I want you to search the Scripture. I don't want you to just be spoon-fed by Pastor John. I want you to be in the Word yourself. And I want you to be students of the Word that hear God's Word, that read God's Word, that memorize God's Word, that study God's Word, that meditates on God's Word, that gets God's Word into your DNA because this book's supposed to be a lamp unto our feet and a light on our path. And the more you study it, the more you're going to fall in love with it. I've been studying this book now seriously now for 38 years. I've got a graduate degree in, in theology. And there's still so much more I can learn in this book. I'm reading through the entire Bible this year with Heidi. We're, we're staying on, on track, too. I tell you, we got through all the prophets. We're back in the New Testament now. But I tell you what, there's so much I'm learning just going through the whole Bible again. So much to be mined in the gold field, the treasure fields of this book. Be a student of God's Word. Amen? Amen. Be a student yourself of God's Word. It will guard you against false teachers. Um, chapter 13, verse 7 is another prophetic scripture. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man, my associate, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, that the sheep may be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. That's pointing to when Jesus is going to be struck and then his sheep, his disciples, are scattered because they all desert him and go up to the upper room. Another prophetic scripture. <clears throat> um, another portrait, prophetic scripture, is chapter 14, 1 through 4. Um, um, won't, you can read that yourselves. Uh, uh, oh, nope, I can't skip that one. Let's, let's look at it real quick. Chapter 14. Just look, let's, let's look at verse 4. In that day... Prophetic scripture, chapter 14, verse 4. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which is in front of Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives will split its middle from east to west by a very large valley, so that the half of the mountain will move toward the north and the other half toward the south. Now, I've been to Israel three times, and each time 
we start, before we go to Jerusalem, we start at the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives oversees the city of Jerusalem. And what it's saying here is when Christ returns, where is he going to return to? Mount of Olives. Interesting. And when he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives, what's going to happen? Earthquake. And the land's going to split. And I believe after he sets his feet on the Mount of Olives and he pronounces his return by an earthquake, then he's going to go through the east gate, according to other scripture, east gate that's still there in the city of Jerusalem, and he's going to come into Jerusalem and establish his reign for a thousand years. Pretty cool. But we know where he's coming back to. He's coming back to Mount of Olives, which overlooks the city of Jerusalem, and then he's going to proceed, just like on Palm Sunday when he came in as the, the king. Triumphant entry. He's going to have another triumphant entry. That's when he returns. He's going to set up his kingdom on earth for a thousand years, and we're going to reign with him. And we're going to not have a democracy. We're going to have a theocracy. And on his side, it's going to be established that he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Isn't that cool? And he's not going to reign as a suffering servant. He came the first time as a suffering servant to die on a cross for his sins. He's coming the second time as a conquering king. And he's going to get it right. And he's going to even put Satan, according to the book of Revelation, he's going to put Satan in chains. So Satan, for those thousand years, can't oppress, can't afflict, can't even tempt us. And the knowledge of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. And little children, creation is going to be so brought back to unity that little children will even be playing with vipers. And they won't get bit. Now, that's going to be a stretch for me. Get away from that snake. But no, everything's going to be at peace, even the creation and the animals. It's going to be glorious. And I say to that, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Good stuff in Zechariah, amen? amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word tonight, Lord. We thank you that your word is true. We thank you that your word points to Jesus Christ. Even in these obscure Old Testament prophetical books, they point to Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who's pierced through for our transgressions, the one who's going to come and set up his kingdom and, and put his feet on the Mount of Olives and cause the earth to shake and cause the earth to split as he establishes his reign here in this world once again. Father, we thank you, God, that we get to be a part of your team we thank you, God, that we get to be a part of your kingdom, Lord. And we get to be a part of establishing your kingdom here on earth. And we pray that part of the prayer that you told us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, God. Father, help us to be people that are under your governing, God. Help us to be people, Lord, that just delight in saying, God, have your way with us. Holy Spirit, govern our lives. We don't want to do this on our own. We want you to lead us, God. We want to trust in you with all our heart. We don't want to lean on our own or understanding, Lord. We want to acknowledge you, God, so you can make our path straight. So, Father, tonight, once again, in church, here on Wednesday night, we just say, have your way, God, your way with our lives, Lord. We, we submit once again. We draw near to you, God, so you can draw near to us. We once again say, God, we love you. We love the way that you clothe us with your righteousness, Lord. You take our filthy rags of sin and you nail it to a cross. And you make us your sons, your daughters. And we could cry out to you, Abba. Abba, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your direction. Thank you, Jesus, for being our cornerstone, being the foundation for our lives the Direction Center. Help us just to do a better job of being led by you, God, directed by you, governed by you, Lord. That's where life is best, when we're fully submitted to you. And God, I pray for people that might be here tonight that are facing some real battles, Lord. May they submit to you, God, resist the devil, so the devil and his demons will flee. Pray for that, Lord, even right now. Just give strength where there's been weakness, Lord. Give freedom where there's been bondage. 
Just do a work, Lord. Even as I'm praying for whoever needs that freedom, Lord, I pray that you'd set them free. Even right now, even tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your power, Lord. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your word, Lord. And we pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.